Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks very much for tuning in. I'm David Lamb, Director of the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan. Very glad to have you join us today for this next installment of our ISR Insights Speaker Series. The goal of the series is to create a forum for disseminating research findings uh, of our faculty at ISR for the public good. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with ISR, we have over 300 affiliated faculty who, along with our excellent staff, conduct research that addresses a wide range of topics, including wealth and inequality, race and racism, politics, and public opinion, and many other topics, including teen drug use, economic behavior, aging, and health. Our faculty come from almost every school and college on the University of Michigan campus, reflecting the true interdisciplinary nature of our work. This webinar is part of a continuing series focusing on the research happening at ISR. All the recordings of our past Insights events are posted on the ISR website, isr.umich.edu, and we'll post information on upcoming talks there and on our social media channels, so check those places out to stay connected. I'm happy now to uh, introduce our speaker for today, Professor Jason Owen Smith. He's Executive Director of the Institute for Research on Innovation Science, IRIS, uh, Executive Director uh, of Research Analytics and Professor of Sociology uh, at the University, as well as Research Professor here in ISR. Uh, today, he's gonna be drawing on his recent book, Research Universities and the Public Good, Discovery for an Uncertain Future, a book I highly recommend, uh, and the work of, uh, of IRIS, which is an amazing project. Jason will explain how research universities serve <clears throat> as an important form of social insurance in the face of an uncertain future. He'll also highlight the future challenges these unique research institutions will face and explain how they might be addressed by federal and state policymakers, university leaders, and faculty at institutions like the University of Michigan. <clears throat> A few housekeeping notes. We're providing live captioning of this event. You can view those captions by turning on the closed captioning feature on your screen. Uh, also note, we'll have a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Uh, the chat feature is disabled, but the Q&A feature is turned on. So I invite you to send in any questions you have through the Q&A feature of Zoom uh, at any time throughout the presentation. And we'll do our best to have uh, Jason answer those questions before our time ends. So thank you all again for joining us today. I'll now turn things uh, over to Jason. Jason, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks very much, David, and thank you all for uh, taking the time to come out and talk with me today. I wish we could all be together so that you could throw the tomatoes in person, um, but what I'm hoping to do today is to give you a sense of uh, how someone like me, uh, situated in the sociology of science, organizational theory, and uh, data and network science, thinks about the kind of institution that we're sitting in, metaphorically speaking right now, a large research university, and how um, using the capabilities for large-scale public good-oriented social science that are built into the ISR in a way that they are nowhere else, I think, um, we can use these to put together uh, all kinds of interesting data and policy research to address these issues, um, some of which are coming to a head in quiet and not so quiet ways through COVID-19. So I like to start as uh, an, an old advisor once tell, told me to, uh, by telling you what I'm gonna tell you. Um, the short version of this is that Research universities like the University of Michigan and about 150 other institutions around the country um, are really important, not just for the reasons we know, but primarily because what they do is create and maintain an essential and unique social infrastructure to let us, um, as a society and as a globe, address what noted philosopher of science Donald Rumsfeld once called unknown unknowns. In other words, universities are important because they serve as a sort of institutional organizational form of social insurance against a really uncertain future. 
And we're seeing how that plays out in real time right now in academic responses to COVID-19. But I believe we also need to worry about what those responses and what policy responses or lack thereof might do to our abilities to handle the next crisis or opportunity. The challenge here is the pandemic for the first time, I believe, in contemporary history, simultaneously stresses all aspects of the university financial model and removes a lot of the flexibility um, that allows for universities to maintain some of their important diversity in mission and approaches. And particularly in the research arena, which I'll be talking about today, this sets up um, a pair of pernicious dilemmas that I think we need to think about our solutions to in you know, very rigorous ways. The challenge is that decisions that we're taking quite urgently right now have larger strategic implications for how the system of universities does its work. And that's what I want to end us on. Part of the answer I'm gonna give you uh, to how to think about this is that one of the things COVID-19 has done is further revealed a dramatic shortfall in our understanding of how research universities do the work of research and how that research and training has an impact out in the world. And so I'm probably not surprisingly, given who I am and giving, given where you're coming for the talk, going to argue that this is a unique opportunity to pull together data and infrastructure, both to address today's problems in interesting and rigorous ways, and also to set the stage for us to protect and understand, um, explain and improve the public value of research universities. So that's it in a nutshell. Let me get into the details. In order to get into the details, I wanna give you a sense of um, what kinds of data are currently missing, but I think are needed. Now I'm gonna do that through a case study. It's a case study uh, some of you may have seen before, uh, but I'll ask you to stick with me toward the end, till the end of it at least. Um, what I'm gonna do is talk you through the story of what is often treated as exhibit A of a giant win, economically speaking, for social, for, for research, period, academically funded research. And then I'm gonna to talk to you about the ways in which the story is more complicated and points at exactly the kinds of infrastructure we need to better understand this kind of activity. So to start, a little bit of hyperbole. Um, well, not even hyperbole, it's true, but um, in 2018, according to the National Science Foundation, universities like ours around the country invested $224 for every man, woman, and child in the country on academic research. About 54 cents of the dollar of that came from the federal government, sort of hovers between 53 and 54% now. The rest spread out from a variety of other sources. We make those investments in our big research universities, um, both to develop human knowledge, a good end in its own right, but also with the more or less explicit promise that the work of institutions like ours will improve the quality of life and well being for the citizens of the US and ideally for the world. But we don't do as good a job as we could, I think, of managing, measuring, and explaining those effects. So here's an example that's always kicked around, or quite often kicked around. In 1994, the National Science Foundation made a grant of $4.5 million to some computer scientists at Stanford. Among other things, that grant employed one of these gentlemen. And now this is normally the point where if we were in an audience, I'd ask if you knew who these people were and you can go through the, uh, the call and response. But I'll simply say, this is Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Page was employed as an RA on this grant. Bryn was a National Science Foundation graduate research fellow also working on the project. In 1998, they filed what became the patent for PageRank, the core algorithm that Google used to do its search engine. That patent cited government interest in this grant. We have here a very straightforward, often cited story about how a single $4.1, $4.5 million grant between in, in six years led to the foundation of a new search engine company that is now, uh, now has a market cap on the order of three quarters of a trillion dollars. So the short version would be 
give grants to the right people doing the right things in the right places, they will invent smart things and improve the way our society works. We can think of all of the things that have followed on from the founding and success of Google. But the story is more complicated. So this guy at the bottom is not probably immediately familiar to anyone in the audience, though maybe. Um, this is a man named Scott Hassan. Hassan was essentially Google employee number three, but he didn't show up on any of the papers or the patents. He was, however, involved in the Stanford Digital Libraries project, and he's responsible apparently for a lot of the actual production coding that made Google work. The other thing that complicates the story is these things that I've just highlighted in the blue square. These are what are called non-patent prior art. So these are things that the page rank patent cites that aren't themselves patents. It's primarily the scientific literature, and it gives you a sense, um, after appropriate sleuthing through the U.S. Patent Office web page and file wrapper, of what the people who were submitting the patent said they relied on. Now, this is important because what it tells us is that neither the people nor the knowledge that became Google sort of sprang up fully formed at Stanford. Indeed, between 1970 and 1997, um, when the page rank discovery was made, the National Science Foundation made about $52 billion in grants. These are five of them. And again, here I would usually ask, what do you all see in common? But I'm going to cut to the chase and tell you these are all National Science Foundation grants that were acknowledged in papers that were cited by the Google page rank patent. In other words, if we wanted to think about what the very easily discoverable relevant precursor investments in research that went into Google's page rank were, we need to actually broaden our lens well beyond the initial grant itself to think about a variety of these things. In other words, this is a very small needle in a very large haystack. There were six grants for about ten and a half million dollars, if you include the page rank grant, which is about 0.02 percent of total NSF obligations at this time. And those grants were made over 30 years in at least five disciplines spread across the country. And that leaves us with a challenge if we want to understand and explain things like this or the even more challenging things like responses to pandemics that universities are embroiled in. A few things that need to be said. So note, uh, a sociology grant, I love this, made when Page was one year old across the country from where Google was founded was a relevant early precursor. And it's a fun one because many of you will recognize this gentleman, um, our very own colleague Mark Mizruki, who was a graduate student on that grant, which was given to his advisor at SUNY Stony Brook. In 1986, they published a tasty little paper that I love and use all the time. It's called something like Mathematical Models for the Decomposition of Eigenvector Centrality. Um, it did not make waves outside of a very esoteric group, but it did solve a mathematical problem that was baked, baked into some of the page rank algorithms, and thus it got cited. The Stanford proposal didn't actually mention the World Wide Web. Right? It was about hypertext linked digital libraries, um, and it was, according to published interviews with the PIs, the graduate students, particularly Page and Brin, who noted that the World Wide Web was an important such thing, and that search might be a useful functionality. Stanford tried to sell the page rank patent. Uh, page and Brin initially didn't want to leave the university, and incumbent search firms passed. Excite, Lycos, and Yahoo all passed on licensing page rank for initial prices in the range of $1 million, which was discounted to $750,000. Uh, two of those businesses no longer exist, and the third licenses the page rank algorithm from Google in order to run its search engine. So what does this all mean? What it means is that the potential value that was realized in Google could not have been clear when relevant investments were made, which leaves us with a dilemma. If we want to support the ability of universities to consistently produce research and people that can generate opportunities or respond to problems that we don't know we have yet, what do we do? 
The follow-on question is, does it matter that we probably know about as much about what we'll need in 30 years as a sociology program officer in 1974 evaluating a grant on a Marxist grant on board of director interlocks knew about the World Wide Web? I think the answer is yes, but that leaves us with some challenges. One challenge, if I can only have one slide, this is a good one, is that we mistake what makes an impact happen from research. We tend to talk about the impact of grants, but grants don't have impact. What grants do is enable work. They allow people like us, um, investigators, to tool up and hire the people and buy the stuff to get the work we propose done. We don't think about that systematically, and that leaves us in the, hmm, what about step two? There's a black box here that needs to be unpacked if we want to have policy implications or be able to have the university do a better job of responding to something like COVID-19 and maintain the capabilities to do so in the future. There's a parallel problem. For those of you who've seen this before, this is a picture of an aggregate of bullet holes in World War II bombers that returned safely from their missions. Now at the time, the naval intelligence officers and statisticians were trying to figure out where to arm, where to armor the bombers to make things, make them more successful. And it took a while before they realized that if you put the armor in the places where there are holes in all the planes that returned, you're not protecting the parts of the planes that were shot on the planes that didn't. This is a, a fast way of talking about selection, but for us, the key insight is that if you only look at documents, things like patents and papers, or the grants themselves, um, there's value to that, obviously, but if you only look at that, you miss important things that don't show up there, the planes that didn't fly home. Those are the Scott Hassans of the world in some ways. And all of the people who make research go and may bring essential technical or other institutional or substantive skills, but don't show up on papers or patents or grants. And these two things together leave us in desperate danger of what Jim March, an organizational theorist, used to call superstitious learning. The idea that we mistake patterns of correlation for causality for a variety of ways, and then institute policies based on those, even though they're wrong. The key example of this is one that was given to me by an economist friend of mine who said, it's as if you were to say, Hewlett Packard and Apple were founded in garages. What we really need to do to seed economic development is build more garages. My suggestion is that in order to think about how this happens, we need a set of data that address these kinds of insights and we need a mechanism to think about all of the complicated ways that they fit together. So these are the key insights that underpin what I'll talk to you about in a second, the data collection at IRIS and some of our thinking about COVID-19. Um, but I also want to pause for a second and think about why it is that universities can do this because diagnosing the dangers for them and the possibilities requires that we think about them as organizations. And again, I'm gonna spare you the, the monstrously detailed organizational theory and uh, go for a story, but I see some Q&A building up, so I hope you all will uh, allow me to dive back into what is interesting when I get back. I'm gonna start with the University of Wisconsin. Now, they're rivals, um, but we like the University of Wisconsin, or at least I do, because it's one of the oldest and largest land-grant institutions in the country, and with Michigan and a few others, one of the prototypical big public universities. Now, what's interesting about Wisconsin is that the university has had, since the early 1900s, a pretty well-established mission that was written into the state constitution as the mission of the Wisconsin system in the middle of the 1970s. And this is that mission. It's called the Wisconsin Idea. The mission of the University of Wisconsin system is to develop human resources, to discover and disseminate knowledge, to extend knowledge beyond the boundaries of the campus, yada, yada. Yada yada. And what it does is point to the complicated, sometimes contradictory, maybe messy, but essentially deeply public and multifaceted nature of the university mission and activities. 
Now, if we wanted a comparison, uh, I use this for a different purpose, but it's worth looking at to sign this up. A few years ago, then Governor Scott Walker slashed the budget of the University of Wisconsin system, and either he or his staff also proposed red line revisions to the state constitution to change its mission. And it changed it to this. And the mission of the University of Wisconsin system is to develop human resources to meet the state's workforce needs, to discover and disseminate knowledge, et cetera. That has the benefit of being shorter, but a few things are lost. Right? The kinds of collective social benefits that we've talked about become individual. They're for a business or an employee. Long time horizons become relatively short. We're tied to the business cycle and particularly to the local business cycle and needs. A national and global focus, which is essential to a lot of cutting edge research, narrows to the state. Uh, the diversity of research and teaching is likely to decline in this kind of setting. Campus boundaries may become tighter as people try to protect their various investments. And I think increasingly this kind of work would further decouple research and the research and educational missions. Right? What this ends up doing in many ways, if we could imagine it as a thought experiment, it didn't happen, is essentially in the language that my children would use at this point in the talk, um, too long didn't read, all the, essentially this revision would strip away all the features that stand to make the next Google possible or the response to the next pandemic. And this happens at a time when many trends for funding, flat federal research investments, declining state appropriations, um, a variety of other challenges have been going in the wrong direction for a long time. So universities are a form of social insurance. They help keep our society paused and ready to address unexpected problems and take advantage of new opportunities. And uh, this little guy right here, COVID-19, um, its effects just bring to the fore what it is that universities do well. So how do we deal with this? Well, I just like these quotes. And so I, I put them up. Data is obviously not the new oil. But the fact that the business press for years now and corporations and universities and pretty much everyone, including the federal government, are taking significant strides to find ways to improve the speed and reliability and interoperability of data leaves us in a position where an institution like the ISR and like the University of Michigan has much to offer. I'm going to talk about one of the things, the thing that, that I think we are offering, um, the team at IRIS and I. So what is IRIS? IRIS is a national consortium of research universities anchored on an IRB approved data repository here at the University of Michigan, which seeks to develop and maintain data for research and reporting to understand, explain, and improve the public value of academic research in higher education. How do we do that? Well, IRIS is organized in an interesting way. Um, there are other models like this, but they're relatively rare. And one of the things that we think this does is give us some interesting possibilities for scaling and for quickly responding to questions that are hard to answer otherwise. So right now, 35 universities, our members, agree to share data. The data are drawn from HR procurement and sponsored project systems on campuses, and they track every payment of wages from a grant to a person, um, any person, faculty, student, staff, postdoc, whether they're on a publication or not. Um, they also trace every purchase of goods and services from a vendor, outside or inside the university, and every sub-award that flows out from one university to another. We bring those data into IRIS and we integrate them and clean them, do a lot of work with them, document them. We also link them to a variety of outcomes, uh, scientific outcomes, patents, papers, dissertations, grant information, um, through partnerships with the US Census Bureau and with a couple of corporate data providers. Um, we also pull together linkages that tell us something about the businesses and organizations that are vendors to universities and the, um, sorry, and the, the, the outcomes and employers of the people who work on research grants. 
And these things together allow us to build a set of data products and reports that flow back to our universities and to other constituents like the AAU, where they're used for everything from research development to government relations. We also de-identify the data and make them available through the Census Federal, uh, Federally St Federal Statistical Research Data Center system and through a virtual data enclave that we maintain that currently has about 250 users or has had from 84 institutions. So this model allows us to do something which is hard to do, but I think incredibly valuable, which is to take data that is already sitting in the systems of major universities for compliance and tax purposes, data about grants, basically, and turn it into long-term comprehensive data about what we think the right level of analysis is for understanding how universities do their work, people, teams, and networks. And so this just gives you a sense of what's in the data. Um, I won't belabor it too much, but I end on a slide that gives you some uh, contact information at IRIS. Uh, these data are available for research use and we encourage their use and have an excellent research support team that you can contact if you're interested in doing some work with this. How does this work? So imagine an NSF grant flows to someone at the University of Michigan. That grant's awarded. The award is tracked by the university in terms of spending. So it allows us to see the jobs on campus associated with the award, the purchase of goods and services from vendors, sub awards to other universities where if they're also members of IRIS, we can see the team, et cetera, et cetera. The move here is to allow us to essentially follow money to trace in some ways the careers of people and the structure of networks. And that's what allows us to both produce timely data. These are snapshots of some of our reports that go to universities and others. Um, timely data for this kind of practical work, but also data that allows us to do and support research that is designed specifically to address the problems of the missing step to the lack of bullet holes and thus the peril of founding garages. So how do we think about that? The three metaphors for thinking about the university, and this is just a stylized uh, image of that diagram that I showed you in data a while ago. Money flows into the universities where it supports the work of discovery, learning, and dissemination. It throws off purchases from goods and, of goods and services, which create jobs and stimulate the economy in their own right. But most importantly, when new knowledge and skilled people who were trained in research leave the university and land out in the world, they apply that knowledge. And that's where grants have their impact. And so in this metaphor, what we're interested in is the area inside the orange dots, which is the question of what that step two looks like. What is it about the ways that grants enable work and that work is done in places like ours that makes universities such excellent, consistent sources of new things or new ways of doing old things? The answer, I think, has to do with the nature of what creativity is in science and elsewhere, but also with the, the structure and organization of universities and the networks that they create and sustain. So as a sidebar from those of you who don't spend your days uh, sitting and, and, and reading uh, Austrian economists on creativity, um, a case. So imagine I'm about to do an ISR Insights talk and I'm sitting here feeling nervous, looking at my hamsters because my hamsters soothe me and wondering what does one wear uh, really to uh, a Zoom Insights talk. Um, and I'm thinking maybe something jaunty, a Hawaiian shirt. That would be great. And then it hits me. US patent 5,901,666, pet display clothing. Now this is obviously a toy example. This is however a real patent. Um, but the idea is that most things that are new, that are discovered, that are invented, are not things that spring fully formed like Athena from the head of Zeus. They are, as the Google story suggested to us, combinations of often far-flung different bits of knowledge and skill that result in a new innovation. And as this suggests to you, 
no matter how much I might like to have a Hawaiian vest with my habit trail attached, um, some innovations fail. Maybe a lot of them. So what that means is that if we want to think about what universities are that make them a great source, um, there's a lovely metaphor that's been developed in this world. Um, and it's the idea that what universities are is essentially a big bucket of Lego bricks. And that makes people like you all and me who work here, um, the spacemen playing with the bricks. The idea is that because universities maintain a deep and diverse knowledge base across essentially the entire sweep of human knowledge, they're full of different sized and shaped bricks. And as a result, they are more than other more focused kinds of organizations uniquely suited to be able to quickly and effectively respond to new pressures and possibilities by putting the bricks they have access together in new ways. How does that happen? Well, this is where I think it happens. I believe it happens in collaboration networks. Um, this is a snapshot of such a network for a university in the upper Midwest that shall remain nameless. And what's important about it is the idea that we can map the entire collaboration structure of a university, at least the, the parts of the university that are doing externally funded research, in a fashion that lets us see organizational features, a medical school, a land bridge through public health into the arts and sciences anchored on an interdisciplinary research institute, which does significant data work. Um, and because we can associate these grants with their topics and organizational locations and people, we can slap labels on them and get a sense of how a given university puts knowledge together in distinctive ways. In this case, we see a set of grants, a big NIH grant for research on the health, the health outcomes and correlates of homelessness for teenagers, very closely proximate to a bench grant for vaccine development in HIV AIDS. And there's no reason a priori to expect that these two things should be similar, except that both grants hire clinicians who are liver specialists as consultants, which makes sense because Hepatitis C is a big challenge for the homeless community, and liver failure is a significant problem for HIV AIDS patients. What this means, though, is that we can develop something like the fingerprint of different universities and string them together through subcontracts in order to begin to measure the ways in which we maintain and can access the sorts of sets of Lego bricks that make universities a consistent source of knowledge. I'm going to skip over this, but this is sort of a start at how we do that work. We can also think about universities as anchors. The idea here is that universities, unlike almost any other type of major organization, are deeply wedded to their place. I mean, we're the University of Michigan, for goodness sake. And it's no more possible to think of the University of Michigan moving to Alabama than it is to think of the University of Alabama moving to Washington State. Right? The idea is that universities both create new possibilities for their regions and sustain distinct business and nonprofit and arts and other communities in their regions. And unlike almost every other major organization than a state government, for instance, they're deeply unlikely to move. They represent um, consistent local capabilities that are tuned in many ways to the nature of their environment. So our engineering department and Stanford's engineering department may teach very, very similar things. And they probably have people competing for, graduates competing for jobs in the same places. However, the historical legacy of close relationships with the auto industry and its supply chain means that engineering at Michigan has a different focus in some ways than engineering at Stanford. There's a reason why we have a big transportation institute and they don't, for instance. And so it's interesting to think about the ways in which universities create and sustain their regions in a fashion that also helps with local resilience. And this is a quick view of how you might think of this, a broad view of impact. Here's a, an article that was published by a professor in kinesiology here, um, actually two of them, Dale and Beverly Ulrich, um, a few years ago. It found that uh, a few minutes a day of training on a treadmill helps infants with developmental diseases, particularly Down syndrome, walk four to six months faster than they would otherwise. 
Now, this is a big deal developmentally, and the University of Michigan treated it as such. But what's interesting for us is that there's this little point here at the bottom that says the treadmills cost about $1,200 each, and Ulrich said that he hopes that more hospitals and parent organizations will rent the equipment to parents. Now, we were asked to think about um, looking through IRIS data to understand how parts of the west side of the state contributed to and benefited from this research. And one of the things we found was that the grants that supported this research bought treadmills from a small engineering business, Carlin's Creations, in southwest Michigan. And that when communications professionals went out and talked with those people and talked with the faculty, what we learned is that this was simultaneously a thing that had real scientific value, that had near immediate practical implications, and that relied on and helped sustain a small business that now has a business line doing precisely what they suggest, which is selling these treadmills for rental and purchase by families and other organizations. And so we have here a sense that the universities work in part because they're part of and help to create ecosystems that help to sustain them and that they help to sustain. Written nationally, that means they're also hubs. Universities are central nodes and networks in their own fashion. And much like the picture of Chicago's O'Hare Airport that I had there, they're metaphorically one hop from anywhere. There's almost no other institution I can think of in the world, in our current world at least, that literally has alumni and affiliates, I think it's safe to say, in every major domain of human activity. You can reach professional sports, national and international symphonies, the elites of science and engineering. And this suggests, and this is findings from IRIS data published a few years ago, about where PhD students who were employed on research grants got their subsequent jobs based on census data. And what this tells you is doctoral students, recent doctoral recipients with research training are dramatically overrepresented in well-paying jobs in industries that span the entirety of what's generally considered the US knowledge economy. So if we think about the ways that universities are positioned and the things they do and their stability and location and the diversity of their knowledge and network fingerprints, we end up with a picture of them where we say, because universities are hubs, problems and opportunities are gonna to flow to them from pretty much all parts of society. And this is why we wanna keep them densely connected and as diversely connected as possible so that they can have, if you will, feelers out in the world so that they can be searching for problems and solutions. Because they're sources, the knowledge and people necessary to recognize and address almost any type of problem on a resident on at least one of their campuses and sometimes on a single campus. And because they're anchors, they represent a sort of permanent endowment of skills and capabilities that is located in a place and that helps to sustain that place. And this requires that we defend and sustain them. And the, these are exactly the features that I think would be lost in that University of Wisconsin proposed revision and that are in danger as a result of COVID-19. So I'm winding down, I promise. But the interesting thing about COVID-19 is that it stresses all aspects of the university budget system. And that means that what is typically a sort of creative abrasion between different missions and approaches and academic disciplines and all of the things that make universities wonderful complicated places are likely to become more destructive and zero sum because We've removing, we are removing the flexibility from the organizational system as COVID progresses. Right? Think about the Great Recession. A few years ago, right, universities actually did fairly well. The federal government uh, cut loose $65 billion of new research support in ERA, the American Recovery and Investment Act. Enrollments actually went up a bit. Um, everyone took hits on endowments if they had them, and there were other issues, no doubt. It was a real and deep recession. But unlike this one, parts of the university that were, if you will, counter-cyclical saw growth and saw growing revenues to support them. 
right? And those revenues to a certain degree can be repurposed and moved around under a budget model like ours to support the public goods that are necessary for universities to work and that allow people to collaborate or compete on a shared platform, which reduces some of the destructive zero sum competition. Now the challenge with that is in COVID-19, other work that I've done suggests that simultaneously, right, tuition is under pressure, auxiliary enterprises that depend on students and residents and other things are losing revenue. Research budgets are flat. The US federal government has thus far declined to pursue a bill requesting $26 billion of relief for research institutions. Um, that's the RISE Act. It's notable that that amount is about 40% of what was in the stimulus in 2008. We can go on and on. Healthcare costs are rising at the same time that revenues from patients uh, performing what are called elective surgeries, even though they're not really, they're, they're necessary, um, are declining. Endowments are down. There are a number, a number of challenges here that remove the flexibility from the budget, which makes us more likely to do things that run us into trouble. Right? And so, ah, what that means is that for research, there's a particular dilemma, right? It's an important one, but it's a little hard to see. So the idea is when the pandemic hit, large portions of the university shut down, right? That imposed a bunch of costs, but the Office of Management and Budget and the federal science agencies in a timely and I think very important step agreed to salary flexibility, which allowed grants to continue, being, to continue paying salaries even when work was shut down. It was a move to protect the academic workforce, those people that made up that network that I showed you earlier, and it was a good one. The challenge is that as the pandemic dragged on, more and more research was shut down, and by the time that flexibility expired at the end of July, there was a distinct possibility that an entire year's worth of grants were facing pretty much a six month budget shortfall due to having paid salaries when they couldn't be working toward their aims of their projects. And that sets up absent real focused federal investment, a dilemma, two of them. One for funders. This is a picture of Francis Collins sitting in front of the Senate when he described this very process and suggested that what it meant is that $10 billion worth of NIH funded research was going to disappear. And what it means is that for funders and funding agencies, absent new research relief, they're gonna face a difficult choice between finishing, supplementing existing projects that have been deemed worthy to finish the work they were proposing and funding new projects that might've emerged from COVID-19 or other places. And that's matched by a similar challenge faced by academics and academic leaders and investigators. Um, all of us are probably facing it in some of our federal grants right now, where if work has had to stop because you're doing human subjects contact or because you're in a laboratory for whatever reason, and you're still paying all of the salaries, you run into the possibility that you might have to trade off down the road staff for being able to complete work. And that's a trade we don't want to make. It's a trade we don't want to make as a university and that we don't want to make as individual investigators, but it is a trade that could damage those networks, the very things that make universities good sources. And so this is an open letter from 51 university presidents to science, which talked this through a bit, but it noted that research is also teaching a key portion of what I was saying earlier when I talked about what makes us sources and the importance of the folks like the pages and brins of the world. Right? And to the extent that this puts pressure on research, it also damages the potential for long-term growth in our scientific workforce. And some evidence is suggesting for the diversity of that workforce um, because communities of color and particularly women with children at home have been taking it harder from the pandemic than have others. 
Now the challenge is this all makes good sense as sort of stark financial logic and anecdote, but traditional data are lacking or lagging, which makes advocacy, any kind of evidence informed response and plans for recovery very difficult. But we can help. Right? And so this is a very fast turnaround work that Iris and its team did. 10 of our member universities submitted an off cycle data tranche to us, which allowed us to look at what precisely is happening at these universities to give you a sense of what's going on. And so what these figures do is compare for each university, the dots, right, how much they spent on direct cost purchases of goods and services to support research. Think about computers, reagents, flights to conferences, data purchases, right? We calculated that number for the identified month this year during COVID relative to the amount that was spent by the same university in the same month last year. And what we see, we treat this as a very rough temperature taking index of how much of the how much funded research activity is currently open on a campus. What we see is that in March, as campuses started to shut down, there's some declines, but we were right about at the same amount. By April, the median is down around 28%. By May, we have about 50% of academic funded research offline, right? Trends about the same for federal funds, a little bit spottier for non-federal funds. And this is important because this is a map of the counties where these 10 universities bought goods and services in 2019. What they do is index that national supply chain, the Carlin's Creations treadmill companies of the world, but also the Fisher Scientifics and the Delta Airlines um, that are you know, providing the things that grants need. So when we think about what's going on, we can actually put a number on how much is shut down and what work isn't being done and which people are funding it and where that has effects in economic terms on another fragile ecosystem, the supply chain, which is very specialized for research. We can also use IRIS data to do a similar thing for employment on grants. And what we see here, again, um, in this case, we're just doing across a three month period, is that all employees, faculty, staff, postdocs, and students, as undergraduates and graduate students just lumped together, right? these dots again show you the university rate of change. Right? So in this time period, the median of these universities protected 98% of its workforce. That's really good news, but the difference between 98% of the workforce being paid for many months and 50% of the work not being done is what creates the dilemma. What's important to note, however, is also when we look at federal funds, that some groups were less protected than others, right? So students and research staff particularly are about as twice as likely to fall off of grants even while salary flexibility is in place as other employees. And this is important because as we look over here in panel C, the vast, well, not the vast majority, but the majority of employees on these grants are students, about 30,000 at these 10 universities in this time period. And you can see that they differ in their balance across funding agencies. What this means is that when the salary flexibility expires, if this dilemma comes to pass and decisions are made to prioritize finishing research in a way that might damage the teaching features of research. It's the students and professional staff who seem most at risk, and particularly perhaps the students. And that is one of the key challenges here, the one that the um, university presidents identified. And so if we summarize this, basically what we're saying is that the short-term stoppage of research coupled with rising costs of managing a pandemic, stopping and starting, reorganizing classes, buying PPE, installing fiberglass, right? all of those things put universities in jeopardy at a time and at the end of a decade of declining or flat funding for research, at the same time as the shutdown aspects of the pandemic create these dilemmas for policymakers 
and for investigators and research leaders. And what that means is that as the pandemic drags on, we'll hope it doesn't because of good, uh, good vaccine news, but as the pandemic drags on and budget pressures mount, what we're going to consistently see, I think, is the danger of stripping key nodes out of those networks right, and of limiting the diversity and reach of the university research workforce which can make universities both less source-like and less hub-like in the language we've been talking about. And so what this means in other terms, I think, is that we're making strategic choices now, whether about an individual grant or how a university uses its institutional research funds or whether and how to fund research relief from the federal government, that have long-term implications that are difficult to see without good data and strong evidentiary base. So you could think about the kinds of things that might be a challenge here. Right? There's going to be a tendency, particularly as we focus quite rightly on trying to do what we can as academic institutions to address COVID-19, that we're going to double down on what we might call mining our existing knowledge bases. What Jim March, the organizational theorist of the garage, called exploitation for search. The idea that we'll put our money into supporting the things that are most obviously and directly A, fundable, and B, um, maybe directly related to the pandemic and the issues and its issues. And that means that what we'll lose is at least for a while, the ability to prospect, to explore, to put together those new combinations, many of which are going to be like the habit trail Hawaiian shirt and fail. What that means then is that over time, if we make the wrong decisions now, or we don't support our capability to continue prospecting, our bucket of Lego bricks is going to shrink and our networks will be less well connected. And that makes it harder to serve as a source. Likewise, because of the differential effects of the pandemic and because students particularly appear to be more in danger than faculty or postdocs, there's a distinct danger to the diversity of the people involved in research, as well as to the topics and approaches. This too has the result of making us less able to connect outside to diverse constituencies and to do good innovative work when we bring in problems and solutions. There are also increased challenges to collaboration that I won't go into because I'm running short of time. The idea though is that we need to make our decisions now in terms not just of solving and weathering the current crisis, but also of doing what we can to support and sustain our abilities to serve as an anchor, a hub, and a source. And to do that, I think we need better data. We need a good framework and we need the ability to talk to people about this at multiple levels in strong and rigorous ways. And that's what I think Iris is trying to do. So I'm just going to leave this here with some contact information and some next steps. I want to make sure that we have at least a few minutes for Q&A and I will stop there. Thank you. Uh, that's great, Jason. Um, <clears throat> excellent, as always. Um, we got a few minutes for questions. We've had a number of, uh, of them come in. Um, I might uh, uh, actually take them in reverse order and, uh, uh, and uh, point to Ernie King's question about, you gave a lot of examples that seem to be very STEM related about the, uh, the payoffs to uh, uh, investment and in research. Do you have some good uh, social science or arts and humanities uh, examples as well. Uh, was rookie was in there, as you said, as a sociology project, yeah. so there's that. Um, there are sociology projects, uh, you know, obviously, um, you know, I think of our own health and retirement survey um, or panel study of income dynamics, for instance. Both of those uh, had the features of what I think um, really, really, really good what you might call use-inspired fundamental social science, uh, what Don Stokes called Pastor's Quadrant Research, 
does. It simultaneously pushes forward human knowledge, but also has direct implications for th things like healthy aging, right? And wealth transfer and inequality, right? These aren't the same kinds of things as say a Google. I use that in part because it's, it's sort of example number one that you hear all the time. And I think it's been treated too simply, um, but they are the kind of things along with the kinds of work that are done in professional schools like public policy, education, social work, nursing, that have direct and important impacts on well-being that may not be as directly economic. Now with that said, I think there are also social science economic impacts and there's wonderful work being done on the humanities, a lot of it anchored on uh, A2RU and the Arts Alliance up on North Campus. That's harder to trace in this regard. In the book itself, I have a few examples of really cool humanities research and ways that you could think of them as, as products of the same networks. I think in terms of uh, economic impact, the near-term hub effects, um, one of the things that I think would be great to think about for large-scale sample surveys particularly is all of the interviewers around the country who are paid and are part of and routinely work in those projects and the ways in which they bring research directly to their communities in a very living fashion that has both economic implications and potentially um, you know, public understanding of science implications. Maybe, maybe as a final question, I'll try to combine uh, some of these questions. Um, you talked about the federal role uh, um, Iris, you might mention uh, the, uh, how Iris itself is funded and perhaps talk about the role of individual donors, the role of foundations, the role of the federal government, and how all that fits together. Oh, that's great. Um, so part of what makes Iris interesting is I think it's business model. Um, so Iris is first and foremost an academic organization. Um, we do research and we're a data repository that makes data available for research. But much of the work we do, the reporting, the report production, the code development, the research support, the training, is very hard to support um, from, say, federal grants. And so our business model relies about 60% on federal grants and contracts and about 40% on contributions from member universities. The challenge is that at a time during the midst of COVID-19, when we desperately need to be able to expand that data, the, 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 these data for all kinds of reasons, the cost to universities of supporting the infrastructure is becoming a bar to growth. Right? And so that's, that's how IRIS's business model is working right now. For the university, and I think IRIS could be a, a, a microcosm of that, typically what has happened is that the federal government accounts for about 54% of, of funded R&D on our campuses. That's down from 10 years ago, it accounting for about 63%, even though um, the total amount of spending has grown dramatically. What makes up the difference has not been foundation or philanthropic or individual philanthropic or industrial funds. Those have all stayed pretty flat. Instead, it's been universities' institutional funds. In other words, we've been using our own money, our revenues from other sources to sustain this and that's uh, not a sustainable process any longer and so I think their roles here for independent individual philanthropists these are the kinds of things I have up here there are roles here for businesses of the sort that you know are vendors to or hire people from or rely on the technology developed by universities to up their support and I think the foundation um, world has played an essential role in uh, essentially seeding lots of new work and the while well, it's relatively small it's essential um, relative to this but low IDCs particularly um, to get very wonky for those of you who think in these terms are a particularly hard thing to stomach in times of austerity in part because uh, precisely of the trend in science funding that makes our own institutional funds um, sort of the growing component. A lot of that is a result of, according to NSF, un unrecovered indirects. Well, great. Well, um, fascinating. It's a great uh, project. I, again, highly recommend uh, uh, Jason's recent book on research universities and the public good discovery for an uncertain 
future if you want to read uh, more about this. Thanks to all of you for uh, joining us. We'll continue our insight series in 2021, so watch for updates on that. Uh, the video from this presentation, along with all of our other uh, presentations, will be available uh, on isr.emich.edu. So thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending all of our insight series in this year, and uh, happy holidays, and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you very much.